All right, so the two packets. The first packet is the list, and this is the list that you're required to know. Everything on this list is gonna be fair game for your practical exams, okay? Everything on here. And believe it or not, I did water it down, okay? Um, so, but we're gonna go over it all in, in a moment. Now the first page is, um, I won't test you on the first page. The first page is just, terms that will help you along. For instance, this here and this here. You're going to see these terms quite often in, in the bones. Okay, This is part of your hip and there's a little area here called the obturator foramen. Okay. On the bottom of the skull, there's an area here called the magnum foramen. Now, they're at two different areas of your body. Obturator foramen, magnum foramen. What do you think foramen might mean? Oh, bingo, okay? What I'm trying to show you here is that these words are going to appear quite often in your studies of the bones. Don't fight it, okay? They're going to be there to help you. If you're going to try and find where is the uh, superorbital foramen and you're looking all over the skull, you're looking for a hole. You see what I'm saying? The names are going to be helping you. There's also on the scapula how it kind of curves in here. It kind of presses it. A, a, indentation, so to say. That's called a fossa. If you look on the side here, it kind of looks like it's indenting like that, like a depression. That's called a fossa. So a fossa means depression, okay? Like you're pressing in there. This is called a subscapular fossa. You wouldn't call it the subscapular foramen. Do you see what I'm saying? Okay. So those words, I'm not going to test you on, but they are going to help you. You're going to see words like condyle, epicondyle, process, uh, spine, uh, meatus. These words are not going to, don't struggle with them. They're going to help you through your studies of bones. Okay? But I'm not going to test you on that, but they're going to be on there. Okay? Now, you turn the page over, you got a list of bones there. Okay? Um, and we're going to break that all down for you. Some of the bones on here have a little number next to it. You see, like frontal, there's one there. The next one is parietal, there's two. That's telling you how many of those bones you have on your body. So there's one frontal, you have two parietal bones. Okay? And then the last page is articulations, and we'll talk about those a little bit later, which in lecture we already talked about. Now, the second packet. I'm always hesitant about giving this to students because I find that students say, well, geez, you just gave us a packet, and there's a bone over here with its labels, and then right next to it, there's a bone, the same bone, with no labels. Oh, it's a little exercise that we could do. We don't need to come into the lab and look at bones. We have this little packet that does this all. Wrong, okay? Your practical exams are not gonna be pictures. And these pictures are black and white. These are pretty difficult when you don't have a bone in front of you and understanding where all the nooks and crannies are. This is just a two-dimensional thing, okay? This packet is good when you know the bone. If you took, let's say, the femur, the thigh bone, and you studied it for about 20 or 30 minutes, and you understand all the 10 or 11 parts of it, and you had it in your hand, now you could leave that here, go home, and now the picture's gonna make a little bit more sense to you because you've already been examining and studying the femur, so you know all the nooks and crannies. You can't tell if it's going in or out by a picture over here. So what I'm saying is this is not a substitute, this is a supplement. And 
I have had students just use this and definitely royally fail the exam by just studying this. Okay? You have to have the bone in your hand to understand and study and examine it before you get into this. Okay? So uh, this is okay, but again, it's not a substitute, it's a supplement. Okay? Questions about that? Okay. And let me just also mention too, there's certain things that are on in your lab book, in your textbook, and even on this packet, there's some labels on here that are not on the list that you're required to know, so you don't have to worry about those. And there's some parts that are on the list that you're required to know that are not on this packet with the pictures and labels, you still have to know them. Okay? Not a lot, but a few on there. Okay? Any questions about how to treat these two packets? Okay. Okay. And this is all in the same PowerPoint my buddy's pulling the spine out of my back. Okay? He's telling me, I got your back. I'm the wrong way. Okay, okay so the skeletal system. All right? Vanishing bones. Sometime in your life you lose 600 bones. Before you're born you had a, you know, uh, we did this all in lecture. Okay? Um, so you can just read this on your own. And remember, it consists of bones, cartilage, tendons, and ligaments. Just to reiterate what this is saying is that we have a lot of fusion going on. And you're going to see these fusions as um, sutures in the bones. So we'll show you those. The function of the skeletal system is going to support soft organs, fights gravity, keeps us upright, protects soft organs. We got a rib cage to protect the heart and lungs. We got a skull to protect the brain. We got a vertebral column to protect the spinal cord, and so forth. Okay. And we have muscles that attach the bones so we can get from one point other place to another point. Stores calcium in and calcium and other salts, sodium, potassium, magnesium. Also, it stores fat in what we call yellow bone marrow. It's also the site where hematopoiesis takes place, where bone formation takes place. Okay? Now, this is new stuff. The way we break up the skeleton is yellow and blue. We don't say yellow and blue, but the yellow here is what we call the axial skeleton, which consists of the skull, the rib cage, and the vertebral column. Then we have the blue area called the appendicular skeleton. And that's going to consist of the arms and the legs and the parts of the bones that they attach to, the girdles. The axial skeleton, skull, vertebra, and rib, rib cage has 80 bones to it. The appendicular skeleton has 126 bones attached to it. Okay? Believe it or not, this is easier to manage with 126 bones compared to the 80 bones. Okay? So we'll explain that. So let's start talking about the axial skeleton, and I'll give you guys a break, and we'll do appendicular skeleton. Rib cage. Okay? And it consists of about 80 bones. Like I said, on that list I gave you, you have parentheses of, with a number in it with each one of the bones. That's telling you how many of those you have in your own body, assuming you're all adults. And you're all adults. Okay? Uh, in children, it's different. Okay? All right, let's talk about the skull. We have the frontal bone up here, the parietal bone, the temporal bone, and occipital bone. Now, I'm going to just let you know that there's no way I have enough time to go over all the bones and all the nooks and crannies. I'm going to go and give you an overview of all the bones, but I'll slow down and go more into detail about what I feel is the most thorny areas that students have to go through. Okay, because I'm going to tell you right now, everything I'm going to tell you is going to go in one ear, out the other. Okay, but I'm trying to show you here where um, where students find the most challenging of it all. Okay, and an overview of everything. So the frontal makes sense where it is, parietal, temporal, and this makes sense the occipital bone, which is why I want you to do that quest. So you understand the occipital area is back here. It'll make sense to you. Now, the problem is, when you look at a white bone like that, it's difficult to see where the bones 
attach to, how they uh, articulate with other bones. Now, if you have it in front of you, you'll see the sutures. But sometimes, for instructional purposes, it might be a little bit easier to have something where it's colored. Okay? And now, this is not going to be on your practical exam. It's only going to be used for instructional purposes. You can take a look at it when I'm here. But it's kind of showing you where the green is going to attach to, and you can see the sutures all in here. For instance, inside here, inside the nasal cavity, you're going to see a red area, at least on this skull, you see the red area. That's the ethmoid bone. But you also see some red when we look inside the eye socket. That's still the ethmoid bone. And if we take this part off here, you can also see some red here. That's still the ethmoid bone. So this helps you to determine, geez, how we're seeing, we're seeing red here, red, that's, that's all the ethmoid bone. So we're really looking at the tip of the iceberg up here, but down below it's in other cavities. So this, a colored skull makes things a little bit easier for you to appreciate and understand and respect what's going on and how your body's put together. So even though we have a white here, your lab book has them colored. They're different colors than what's on there, but still, it's separated by colors, and you can see how big uh, the frontal bone is and how they fuse together. So again, the frontal bone, the parietal bone, the temporal bone, the occipital bone. We have two temporal bones and two parietal bones, but at this view, you can't appreciate that there's two there. We're going to show you different angles. Now, I also want to introduce you to things that might be a little bit challenging for you. Not only do you need to know about the temporal bone, but it's five or six structures of them, or parts of them also you need to know. Like there's a hole in there, and that's called the external acoustic meatus, and that's going to lead to inside your ear. This bony prominence over here is called a mastoid process. Something that's bony that's sticking out like this, like a little finger that comes out, that's a styloid process. There's a little muscle that goes from the styloid process and it goes to your hyoid bone that's over here. It's called a stylohyoides, or stylohyoid muscle. It makes sense. So if you understand parts of the bones, it's gonna help you with muscles and other things, okay? Here's where it might be a little confusing, too. This area here is an arch. You really can't appreciate it at this angle, but it comes up. This is the same arch, different colors, but that's the arch. We call that the zygomatic arch. You can only see it if you put it this way, and now you can see the zygomatic arch. Okay, you'll see, I got pictures showing you this. But it's an arch that comes out. Now, there's a pointy prominence that comes out of the temporal bone, this pink area. Just here, what this is. This is the zygomatic process of the temporal bone. This is the mastoid process of the temporal bone thyroid process of the temporal bone. This is the zygomatic process of the temporal bone. We also have the zygomatic bone here in blue. And there's a little point over here that comes off of that. And that's called the temporal process of the zygomatic bone. The zygomatic arch is made up of two bones, the temporal and zygomatic bone. Specifically, what parts of them? The zygomatic process, I'm sorry, the zygomatic arch is made up of the zygomatic process of the temporal bone and the temporal process of the zygomatic bone. When they're talking about the processes over here, they're telling you that what bone it actually attaches to. You wouldn't call this the, the temporal process of the temporal bone. It wouldn't make sense. There's a nomenclature that goes on. We call this the zygomatic process because it attaches to the zygomatic bone. This is called the temporal process because it attaches to the temporal bone. There is an organization here. 
don't fight it. Once you find it, then follow it. It'll make your life easier. Okay? Questions on that? And you can see similar things as we go on. This is, again, showing you at a different angle. Again, here's the zygomatic bone. Here's the temporal bone. Here's the zygomatic process of the temporal bone. Here's the temporal process of the zygomatic bone. That's your cheekbone. That's what you feel with your cheek. You're feeling the zygomatic process. Or the zygomatic arch, rather. Okay? You'll also see where the jaw attaches to the temporal bone. This joint here is the temporal mandibular joint. Or some people use the abbreviation, TMJ. You've heard of that. It's where the temporal or where the mandible articulates with the temporal bone. Okay? Again, the mastoid process of the temporal bone, the styloid process of the temporal bone, the uh, external auditory or external acoustic meatus, which is the opening going into the ear. Okay? Right now I realize, and no pun intended, going in one ear out the other, right? Okay? I understand that. Okay? This is the front area. All right? This is the maxilla bone. That's where your upper teeth are attached to. You have two maxilla bones. The upper teeth are only attached to the maxilla bones. The lower teeth are attached to the mandible. This is the orbit. The orbit is where your eye, uh, that's the eye socket, where the eyeball goes in. You have a hole that's found under that orbit. This hole, listen to the words, is called the infraorbital foramen. Foramen means hole. It's found inferior to the orbit. Infraorbital foramen. What do you think that hole is that's found above the orbit? Supraorbital foramen. See? makes sense. And here's another little tip for you. If you have an infraorbital foramen, you're going to have a supraorbital foramen. Otherwise, they probably would have just called this the orbital foramen. Okay? Or some other name. Okay? Nasal bones up there. There's another view of our zygomatic bone. Alright? Still blue. Okay? There's the frontal bone. You can appreciate that it's one bone there. Again, showing the same thing, but um, you know, infraorbital foramen. Okay. Here's the posterior side of the skull. One occipital bone, but now you can appreciate the two parietal bones, separated by the sagittal suture, which makes sense. Here's another suture. This is called the lambdoid suture. Separates the occipital bones with the parietal bones. And this is just showing you the back side. Okay? In color. Same thing here. Like I said, you don't have to worry about the sutural bones. I won't answer you about those. This is the top or superior view of the skull. Nose is down here. There's the back of the skull. So now you can see the frontal bone. You can see the coronal suture going through the coronal plane. The sagittal suture going through the sagittal plane. And there's your lambdoid suture. Now, a little crazy now. We're taking the skull, okay? And we're just lifting up like that. So we're looking at the inferior portion of the base, the outside of the base. Now you can appreciate the zygomatic arch. You can see the temporal process of the zygomatic bone, the zygomatic process of the temporal bone. The occipital bones here, 
with a huge hole. It's the largest hole in the skull. Foramen magnum. All right, our spinal cord comes out of there. There'll be two areas that are a little knobby on the sides here. Those are called the occipital condyles. And we'll make sure you know what condyles are. They would make sense what that is. And we'll get back to that when we talk about the vertebrae. The roof of the mouth. The roof of the mouth is called the palate, and it's made up of four bones. The maxilla bones, there's one here, and our upper teeth are attached to it, and the other maxilla bone is over here, and the upper teeth are attached to that. It fused in the middle. We also have towards the back part of the, por the posterior portion of the roof of your mouth, the hard palate. This is called the palatine bone, which kind of makes sense. That was made up of two. There's one palatine bone here and another one over here. So the roof of the mouth, the hard palate, is made up of two maxilla bones and two palatine bones that fused in the middle. And it does fuse. You need that fusion there. You have that. That's what makes us also a little bit more advanced than some other creatures. What does that roof of the mouth, what does that allow us to do that you just take for granted? Not talk. Not articulate. Do you ever have a cold, a stuffed up nose, and you try to eat? What happens? You can't breathe, right? Your nose is all stuffed up. <laughs> so this shelf between the nasal cavity and oral cavity allows us to breathe and eat at the same time. You see that? This is something earlier ancestors didn't have. This is what makes us a little bit more advanced. Wolves don't have this. So literally, wolves, when they eat, they wolf down their food because they can't breathe when they're eating. You see? Okay? Again, uh, physiology reflects anatomy. Keep saying that, right? That function reflects structure. Now, this is supposed to fuse in utero, right? Inside your mother's womb, it's supposed to fuse. If it doesn't fuse, then this palate is left open. We call that a cleft palate. Now, if you understand the whole wolf story, why is a cleft palate not good? See, babies can't chew, they have no teeth, so the only instinct that they get dealing with the mouth is sucking. They're not gonna be able to suck on a mother's breast, they're not gonna be able to suck on a bottle, because they can't produce that pressure. If there's an opening there, then you can't create a pressure in there because you can't suck, because it's connected to the outside world with the nasal cavity. You see? So mothers are taught how to feed their babies with cleft palates. You gotta hold the nose over here for a certain amount of time, not too long, right? Hold the nose while it sucks, and then you gotta let go, and to teach how to do that until they could get a surgeon to fix this. Sometimes just the lip itself has a, a cleft there, not the palate itself. Then you would have this cleft lip. All right, some people would call it a hair lip. Not hair like this, but a hair, H-A-R-E, like a rabbit, like a hair would be up with a rabbit, okay? So questions about this, understanding this, okay? All right, um, so that's what I wanted to say a few things on it. Also, we have another bone here called the sphenoid bone. Okay, it looks like a bat. Um, let me introduce you to my friend, the exploding skull, because this could be on your practical too. We refer to this as the exploding skull, Ooh. okay, because uh, it looks all exploded. Um, I will not take a bone off of this and ask you what bone this is. I think uh, that might be too advanced for, for you at this time right now, so I won't do that. But I can have this on here, and you can actually see where the bones are in relation to the other bones. So I'll have it on there. 
okay, where the zygomatic bone or the temporal bone and so forth. But if I took off the sphenoid bone, it looks like this. Looks like a, a bat. Right? It looks like a bat. And it has its wings. And we'll show you that what it looks like inside too. It has lesser wings and greater wings and so forth. But that's what that is in there. So I won't take it off for, for you guys, but just so you know what it looks like, okay? Alright, I think that's about it. Okay. Now this is what you're seeing. Now what we're gonna do is just take this. Okay, that's what you're seeing, the base of the skull, the external. Then we're gonna turn it around and remove this. That's all we're gonna do with the next picture. That's what this is. So now we're looking at the base of the skull, but we're looking in the inside, okay? There's our foramen magnum. We're just looking at the inside. That's the occipital bone over here. Temporal bone is over here, pink, or red. There's our sphenoid I told you about. Looks like that bat. All right, kind of sits like that. You'll see the lesser wing up here and the greater wing over here. You'll also see this area, and that's why you can't tell from a picture, but there's an area here that looks like a little bony cup. It's called a cella tersica, which sits right here. That's where the pituitary gland is going to sit in. The pituitary gland looks like a little cherry. It sits right in the cella tersica. Okay? This area up here is the tip of the iceberg, or the tip of the ethmoid bone. The ethmoid bone looks like a little cube rock. And you can see parts of it in the eye socket, in the nasal cavity, and now you're seeing the top of it at the, in, at the base while you look inside the skull. There's going to be a screen there that's black. And there's holes in there. We call that the cribiform plate. And the cribiform plate has these holes to allow the olfactory nerves which leads for sense of smell. They go through these holes into the nasal cavity so you can smell. Okay? There's also going to be a pointy thing that really goes in the middle there that points up, and it's called a cristagallum. Okay? And that's up there too. Okay? Again, whatever is on that list that you require to, that's all I would ask you. So I may be doing other things on here that might say other things or other schools they would want and they need to know this stuff. So uh, I don't, I forget what yours says. But whatever's on that list, that's what you're responsible for. Okay? So that's inside the skull. Okay? Inside the eye socket. So you can appreciate where all these are in there. Going with it here. Okay? The seven bones that make up the eye socket or the organ. Sinuses. We have areas in bones that have air spaces. We call them sinuses. They're there to lighten our head so we don't have a brick up there and we need big muscles to hold up the head like Arnold Schwarzenegger would. But they're also there to do something with the air that we're breathing in. Now before I explain that, let me just explain to you really briefly what bones have sinuses? There's four. There's frontal sinuses, there's sphenoid sinuses, there's ethmoid sinuses, and there's maxillary sinuses. So they're found in the frontal, the sphenoid, the ethmoid, and the maxillary bones. They're lined with pseudostratified epithelium. And there's mucus or goblet cells there. When you breathe in cold air, go to zero degree weather, which we hope we're in right now, but 
Zerbi weather. You breathe in that cold air, which is dry and cold. If that goes straight into your lungs, your lungs will go into shock and everything will constrict. It's not good. And it's not good drinking, breathing in dry air because it doesn't have a good, um, you learn about an AMP too, but it doesn't really absorb uh, the oxygen properly in an efficient way. So you gotta moisturize the air and you gotta warm the air. Well, in the sinuses, you got pseudostratified epithelium that have goblet cells there that are going to produce mucus to moisturize the air. You'll also have, it's loaded with uh, blood vessels. Blood is about a, a degree, half degree to a degree uh, more warmer than the rest of your body. So this has a lot of blood vessels going there. So as blood, as, I'm sorry, as air goes, passes through your sinuses, it's gonna warm up the air before it gets into your lungs, okay? So that's what happens with that. That's the other purpose of this. So do you understand why your nose runs in that cold weather? Which I don't understand if your nose runs and your feet smell. It should be the other way around, but that's beside the point. Okay, you gotta think about that one. But do you understand why your nose runs in cold weather? Why? Why does your nose run in cold weather? Yeah. Your cells, your goblet cells, are very active with all this cold, dry air coming in. They're going to work on overtime to try and moisturize that air. And that's why you get the runny nose with that. Okay? Not because you've got pneumonia. Okay? Although that could be a reason, but it's not usual. Okay? So questions about sinuses and its functions? Okay? All right. The mandible. All right, I think it's pretty straightforward, the parts of the mandible, I'm not gonna spend time on that. Uh, you can probably just look at the mandible and see those. This is what it looks like on the lateral side, and on the medial side, this is what it looks like, okay? So, I'm not gonna go into the details about it. Whatever's on that list, you need to know. Uh, the hyoid bone, the hyoid bone is in the throat. It's this bone right here that's floating. In fact, that's the only bone that does not articulate with another bone. It's actually suspended by muscles. See it? It's suspended there. It's there for two reasons. One, to help with talking, voicing, and also to help with swallowing. All right? It just looks like this view. And you don't have to worry about the parts of it. Okay? The ear bones, which we'll talk about when we get into the ear much later on, but there's three bones in your ear here and three over here. We call them the auditory ossicles. And we'll talk about the, what they're there for and the names of them later, but just understand, that's all I really want you to know, ear ossicles or auditory ossicles. Now, babies, newborns, fetuses, Their skull bones are not fully fused. They're in the process of fusing. So we have areas where it hasn't been fused yet, and there's a membrane there. We have two major ones, the anterior and the posterior. These areas are called fontanelles. We have an anterior or frontal fontanelle and a posterior or occipital fontanelle. These are the soft spots, and we have fetal skulls here. At least this one's labeled as the frontal fontanelle. It's plastic, all right? I wouldn't do that to a real baby. <laughs> it's plastic, okay? Medical professionals can utilize this on babies. There's fluid underneath that area called cerebral spinal fluid. If you feel this area and you could actually press on it, not all the way through, God forbid, but you know, just press on it. Some people say, oh, I don't want to do that. No, just press on it. It should be taut. Kind of like you ever see um, like a Mylar balloon filled with air, those shiny mirror balloons that you see in dollar stores, you know what I'm talking about? When it's filled with air, when you press, it kind of gives a little bit, like bouncy, 
Okay? That's the way it should feel. But if the child is dehydrated, fluids, you know, just di diarrhea, or just not eating well, whichever, then the fluids all over the body is gonna be low. And when you press on that, it's kind of like a mylar balloon that has lost some of its ear. You know how it's like crinkly? And you press in it? That's what happens over here. So we can actually assess if a child is dehydrated or not by just pressing on that soft spot is what they call it. Okay? Adults obviously don't have that anymore, so there's other ways. You could pull up on the skin and see what we call skin turgor, or, or uh, you could just do blood tests for that matter. To look in a person's mouth. There's other ways to check this out. Okay? So these are fontanelles. Anterior or frontal fontanelle, posterior occipital fontanelle. Okay?